Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Working That Is Chrononaut Chronicles. My name is Bill, and I will be your guide on this particular Sonic Adventure. The show is, of course, sponsored by mysticalwares.com. Derek is not with us today, but I am joined by special guest chrononaut, Ken Rolla. Ken, thank you for being here. Oh, it's my great pleasure, Bill. So before we get started, uh, I do like to uh, just remind the listeners what it is exactly we do here on Code or Not Chronicles, and this being a a spell of sorts, a working, right? It's a work in progress. There are components to, to a spell, right? There are parts to it, and these are our show segments. We have four of them. Uh, they are the Almanac segment, the Gratitude segment, the Silver segment, and the Sword segment. And so the idea behind the first step the almanac segment is simply an exercise in awareness and i choose to use the almanac because it it points out various helpful things including uh celestial alignments which uh, i believe do have somewhat of an effect on us Um, i did was just reminded uh, a little bit ago that the bible does actually make reference to the zodiac in particular and specifically the pleiades so uh, just a quick run through of the almanac to to give us some uh, some more awareness and perspective. And today is Thursday. Uh, it's Pi Day. It is uh, March fourteenth. So there, there's that for you. That was not in the almanac, but uh, uh, the almanac does say that Uranus and the Moon is conjunct today. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, is the Ides of March. So any of our uh, Julius Caesar fans out there, I guess. <laughs> Uh, not a whole lot going on Saturday. Sunday is St. Patrick's Day, though, and we also have the Neptune. I'm sorry, the Sun and Neptune conjunct on Sunday as well. Uh, nothing happened on Monday. Tuesday is the equinox, and coincidentally, uh, or or maybe not, it is the show's one year anniversary. So, Ken, thank you for for being here for, with me. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. And uh, yeah, that, that does it for the, the Almanac segment. So just a s- super quick exercise in, in awareness there. And uh, gratitude, the gratitude segment. Um, the idea behind this segment is because it is a spell, right? Love is, is an important um, it's an important ingredient, right? So it's something we like to emphasize here on the show. And to help make that heart-brain connection, we just like to share something that we're we're grateful for it could be something big could be something small it could be you know it, it could be anything it really doesn't matter what it is but the point here is to uh, like i said make the heart brain connection and not to just do it while we're on the show or like once a week when we meet or whenever we listen to the show the idea here is to stretch that out into infinity so we're in a perpetual state of gratitude and so for this week's show uh, my gratitude is going to be weddings uh, I'm going. I'm going to a wedding this weekend. Actually, I'm leaving tomorrow, and this will be the third wedding in like nine months I've been to. So, lots of uh, lots of weddings. Uh, it's just a good time. It's a lot of uh, you know happy energy to be around, which is a you know can be a good change of pace, uh, depending on what your daily environment. You know what kind of you know what you surround your. What what are you ingesting, right? Are you paying attention to the news and all hyped up and and angst all the times, or or are you relaxed and having a good time like at a wedding? So it just kind of helps to uh, yeah take take the edge off. It's a little mini vacation, right? So yeah, just that's that's my gratitude. Just weddings. So, um, and so Ken, Ken, um, thank you for being here again. And uh, not to put you on the spot, I should have warned you a little maybe more than just prior to recording but do you have anything that you are grateful for today yeah uh, for me it's kind of easy i'm just grateful to be alive and i'm grateful for my wife so i'd say i'm grateful for my life and my wife um i you know i've worked with a lot of advanced technologies over the years and i've created solutions for people that go against the um let's say the mainstream agendas on earth for controlling people and so I've had attempts on my life and I've almost died a few times and through it all, my wife has always been there supporting me and been behind me and I'm extremely grateful to her. And I'm also extremely grateful to just have the most amazing life I've ever, it's, I mean, if I, if somebody came to me and told me that they had experienced 
the things that I've experienced, I wouldn't believe them because it's so out there. But I've been just very blessed to have just incredible opportunities and have seen things and had done things that most people would never have access to in a lifetime. So I'm, I'm just grateful to be alive. And I have to say that I, I really appreciate that how honest you are about talking about these experiences because, you know, not a lot of people, you know, can, can, um, I'm not saying that there are a lot of charlatans out there, but <laughs> I have run across a few in my day. Right. But uh, for anybody that uh, is following along on, on, I guess my personal podcast career, we did speak with Ken on 13 questions. And so uh, everybody, every guest that we've had on there has been great. And, uh, the 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 uh, cut from a different the character is cut from a different cloth, right? So, um, Ken, I, I really really do look up to you and um, appreciate the work that that you've done. I actually do have one of your rest shields. Uh, huh? I bought one of those like oh, man six years ago, I think. Wow! And it's still I mean, plugged in and kicking. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got some that've been going for over a decade, running point four seven. Wow, wow! I don't use the uh, the nightlight though, but I do check it every once in a while just to make sure. <laughs> it, you know, we uh, we did some calculations and we figured out based on the, the the light, the nightlight is an LED, and based on the lifespan of that thing, it should be able to run eleven years around the clock oh, wow. and still be okay. Awesome. And even if it does burn out, it's it's easy to replace. So. Yeah, they just don't, there's nothing for them to break. The They don't, you know, the electronic circuit doesn't get hot or anything. So unless you have a power surge or something, they just keep going and going. Yeah, it's it's been a good investment on my end, I think. And since we mentioned it, we might as well go ahead and kind of explain what exactly it is that we're talking about. Um, okay. We do kind of talk about scalar energy on the show because Derek has some type of scalar device where he gives weekly free sh sessions to a group of people that sign up so awesome. we have a yeah. little bit of knowledge but not a whole lot of knowledge on scalar energy well it's what scalar energy scalar scalar energy first of all is kind of an unfortunate term that has come about through the military and academics because there are scalars in physics and there are scalars in mathematics and when you start talking about that with mainstream scientists and engineers they completely dismiss it because of that. And, and also it's not well understood. The military is know very well about it, but it's kind of simple what it is. Um, it's just superluminal light. It's a subtle energy. It appears like subtle energy to us, but what it really is is light that's traveling millions of times faster than the speed of light. And it emanates from the centers of galaxies and it permeates everything. It actually passes through the space in between subatomic structures and subatomic structure, what we've been taught, what's called the Bohr model of the atom, B-O-H-R, um, is incorrect. And so uh, there are people that have shown that now. And most, most scientists and physicists worth their cloth know that now. But at any rate, this, this energy emanates from the centers of galaxies and it's, it's weird. It's kind of the opposite of conventional uh, electromagnetic energy, where electromagnetic energy travels in what are called transverse waves. You can think of it like a flashlight. We you know, turn it on and the waves, the light waves come out. And as they go away from the source, they get broader and weaker as they go away. Uh, whereas with scalar waves, if you can imagine having a flashlight, you turn it on, but the light is invisible because it's traveling so fast. And at the source, it's spiraling like a tornado um, in a big vortex at the source and it folds in on itself just like a tornado. So as it goes away from the source, it actually gets stronger and, you know, until it reaches the apex of the vortex. And so it has all these really weird properties because it's like interdimensional. It can travel through 3D space and time, but it can also travel through other frequencies of space and time. And it's really what everything is made of. It's what all matter and the electromagnetic spectrum of energy is made of. So this energy not only does it emanate from the centers of galaxies, but it's been discovered at the center of all suns and planets that they have what people might commonly call a black hole. It's like these interdimensional portals that allow this energy to flow through. And so at the center of the galaxy, we've been told that there's a giant black hole at the center of our galaxy and all galaxies. But in reality, what that is, is a giant superluminal sun. 
And the light energy coming out of it is traveling so fast that it appears invisible to us and our instruments. So they'll call it a black hole or dark energy or dark matter or whatever. But that energy, when it travels, it spirals and it branches as it goes. That branching is known as fractaling. And so it slows down and coagulates into or densifies into matter and the electromagnetic spectrum of energy. And so it's relayed throughout the cosmos through these black holes at the centers of planets and suns. And it creates this cosmic web of energy, kind of like a big spider web of energy throughout the cosmos that's emanating from the centers of galaxies. And so when it comes to us, it's coming down to us from our sun and up from the center of the earth because it's been discovered at the center of the earth. There's a black hole about maybe the size of a basketball. And this energy, this superluminal light emanates out of that. And as it passes through the crust of the earth through those minerals minerals are oscillators and they change frequencies and so the geology of earth will actually alter the frequencies and create these natural frequencies that are harmonious to living organisms and then all living organisms are antennas that pick this up you know human beings plants and animals any kind of living organism it's what's known as a skater fractal antenna which just means it's an antenna that branches like a tree which we are, you know, you look at our bodies, we've got two arms, two legs, fingers, and a head. And we also have, you know, a lymph system, a blood system, a nervous system. It's all fractal, it's all branching. And so all living organisms are like that. They're, they're basically fractal antennas that pick up that energy. And I liken it to God consciousness because it has intelligence. It's been shown in scientific experiments that there's appears to be an intelligence behind it. And so really what it is, I think, is it's, it's like a a mass consciousness uh, that's who knows how big it is, but we're parts of it because we're little fractal antennas. We pick that God consciousness up and we rebroadcast it around us and we put our frequency on it. So you have your unique frequency and I have my unique frequency and all living organisms do kind of like snowflakes. There's, there's repetition and there's similarity, but there's also uniqueness at the same time. And so, so that's, kind of what scalar energy is in a nutshell. It's just a term for that type of energy. And there have been many names assigned to it, uh, like tachyon energy or zero point energy or vacuum energy or whatever, chi, prana, uh, you know, all of those names are really just names for different manifestations of this energy of consciousness that is light. And so what that really means is we're light beings. We're really composed of light and we're living in a holographic universe. I love that you said light beings. One of, one of the first episodes I put out on this show was called uh, Beings of Light and Meatloaf. <laughs> Meatloaf was a was a joke, but uh, the uh, the Beings of Light was in reference to uh, Fitz Albert Pops. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Yes. Yeah, yes. So, super familiar with that. Um, I did remember that the device that Derek has is one of the Rife frequency machines. Oh, yeah. Is, is Royal Raymond Ripes that that's he worked with scalar energy too? It's all the same, it's exactly. Same yeah, that's the same thing, right? In Ripes' day, he started out making it electromechanically, and now people have miniaturized it and they're using digital circuits to make it. But yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's just a device that captures this energy that's all around us and then it alters the frequencies. And Rife discovered that, well, first of all, Rife developed a, a microscope that could magnify a half million times. So he could actually look at um, bacteria and supposedly viruses. Um, and so he figured out all this stuff about microbiology and the structure of the body, and the energetics of the body. And what he discovered was there were certain frequencies, these super high frequencies, which are skater frequencies. They're way beyond the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. And uh, he discovered that when he would bombard the human body with certain frequencies, it would kill those pathogens whether it's a parasite or a bacteria or a virus. And so he wound up over years kind of mapping out what various frequencies would do in the body and what benefits it would have. And he discovered for one thing that it, he could use frequencies to cure cancer. And so um, he wound up developing about almost 900 different frequencies for different purposes. And so you can buy these machines now. Uh, for a long time, they were you know suppressed, rife, had his equipment taken. Initially, when he went to the medical establishment, it was very well received. Uh, medical doctors 
this is before the American Medical Association. And I've heard, I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that the AMA was formed to stop Rife back in, the, I think, the early, either early 1900s or late 1800s. But at any rate, whether that's true or not, uh, that definitely initially he was very well received by the medical establishment until greedy doctors uh, realized that it was um, a paradigm shift that could threaten their livelihoods. And so he was squashed and his technology was sequestered away for many years. And eventually it came back out. And now it's uh, much more common. You can buy it in miniature form or you can buy big machines. But it's amazing what it'll do. I have a little pocket device. I don't have it with me here, but I have a little uh, pocket ride machine. You can get them on eBay for about, uh, I think they're about $900 now. But it looks like a little, an old you know, one of the original iPods and you just turn it on and it has different programs for different ailments and you just let it run and, and it'll, you know, it can do anything from waking you up if you're sleepy to killing parasites in the body. I think it even has a COVID program in it. So it's quite amazing technology. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, the more emphasis that we can put on healing with sound and light going forward, I think the better off that we'll be as, as a species, but the, that particular microscope that he, uh, invented, that's kind of lost technology now, isn't it? We're not able to replicate. What... Right. I don't know of anybody that, and I've bumped into quite a few people who have old rife papers and documents and other people's stuff, but I haven't met anybody that has the plans for his microscope. So I don't think if it, if there's any out there, they're definitely not out where it's in the public eye. There was also a guy named Elmer Nemus in the, uh, I think in the 1950s, who developed a microscope that could magnify 5 million times. And it was an actual optical microscope. It's pretty amazing. And at 5 million magnification, he could look inside of atoms. He could see, and actually, if you go online and Google um, Nemescope, which is N-E-M-E-S-C-O-P-E, uh, and go to Google Images and just search on Nemoscope, you'll see pictures of iron atoms, the inside of iron atoms that were taken with a Nemoscope. And it's absolutely amazing because it, it confirms a lot of what we believe about atomic structure, but it also um, denies some of what we've been taught about it. But uh, really fascinating. And of course, Nemus, same thing happened to him. You know, He got too public with it. He wound up disappearing in his technology went away, but I wound up meeting a doctor who was given his um, his literature and documentation for his technology. And, uh, but I don't know of anybody that's brought that back out either. I'm definitely gonna have to look at some of those Google images later, because it sounds really cool. It's uh, mind blowing. It's really mind blowing. Just and it also, by the way, it confirms a lot of what Nassim Harriman has been teaching about the structure of the atom because Nassim has been um, going against mainstream physics uh, about atomic structure and the Bohr model of the atom. And um, Nemus's work and other people's work uh, confirms what, what uh, Nassim Harriman is saying. And Nassim's not just conjecturing. He's a hard you know, physicist, so he, he, he backs everything up with experimental and, and scientific evidence. But yeah, it's it's quite interesting because we're the nature of reality and the nature of matter and energy are not what we've been told they are. Right. I'm I'm a little bit familiar with Nassim's work. My wife actually has one of the arc crystals that he sells. Yeah. Yeah, there's a great he's got I don't know if they have it streaming, but I know he used to have some DVDs called The Black Hole. And it's W H O L E. And that's a really good um several hours of information about the structure of the universe. And uh, it's really fascinating. Um, and so I use that with, with a lot of other concepts that I've been exposed to, to teach about the nature of uh, how consciousness creates reality. And so I've got videos out there about that. So now that we kind of have an idea of what scalar energy is, uh, is it something that's harvestable? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you can, for example, a pyramid, you can just build a pyramid and that will harvest it uh, because what a pyramid is and cones also, if you make it out of a electrically non-conducting material, it will pick up this energy that's all around us and that's emanating from the earth and the sun and the cosmos. And it will create, create a toroidal field of skater waves around the pyramid. And then it will also send a 
um, a double helix vortex up through the tip of the pyramid. And so you can do things, for example, like clearing chemtrails with that or clearing air pollution. If you make a strong enough, big enough pyramid, that vortex will actually uh, clear the atmosphere for a very large area of uh, pollutants, including uh, chemtrail pollution or whatever, and it will send it out into space. And I know that for a fact because I've done it, and not just with pyramids. I've developed technologies, really small ones, like a, a little device about the size of a two-gallon bucket that will clear a 150-mile diameter of all air pollution and sends it out into space. And when you do that, that balances the charge in the atmosphere, and then you get normal weather for your area. So you don't get all these weather extremes that are being caused by geoengineering and you know pollution and things. Um, so yeah, you can build pyramids, you can build cones. Um, there's a, in a uh, used to be an Egyptian archaeology professor named Nasi, uh, excuse me, Ibrahim Karim, and Ibrahim Karim teaches how to build little structures that look like Egyptian hieroglyphs that are actually skater wave antennas that will pick up and broadcast specific frequencies. And so he's got classes on what he calls biogeometry. And it's really fascinating, but that's basically picking up um, skater energy around us and rebroadcasting it in that way. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of technologies. Militaries use this technology all the time for weather warfare and energy weapons and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, it's like, it's uh, the cutting edge frontier of um, technology and most mainstream scientists don't know anything about it and, and dismiss it as nonsense. But believe you me, the people in the military don't because I've met quite a few people in military and intelligence community agencies and uh, they know all about it. And every now and then they'll contact me uh, because I've been working with it so long. So is this then what the rest shield does? It harvests it and then, and then kind of directs it out into your immediate uh, household field. I guess it's kind of a house can cover you know yeah space, right yeah it does in a, in a more active way it uses electricity uh, to create pulses of electricity that shut on and off really fast kind of like uh you know when you've got plumbing and you have water rushing through really fast and you slam it off all of a sudden you get water hammer well if you do that with direct current electricity uh what will happen is it'll actually create skater waves and so if you shut the flow on and off at a specific rate it will create skater waves of specific frequencies that can be very beneficial to human beings, just like a rife machine. And so, you know, the military uses it for nefarious purposes, but uh, you can use it for healing. And in the case of the rest shield pyramid for EMF protection, because that, that pulsing skater field, when electromagnetic radiation hits it, all of those waves, which are normally bouncing around, reflecting off of surfaces and coming at you from all different angles, when they pass through the body, they interfere with cellular communication and brain function and nervous system function. And of course, the stronger it is, the worse that gets. It can even cause cancer, like with a cell phone or something. And so, but when you're immersed in the skater field from that rest shield device, all those waves become parallel. So when they pass through the body, they're much quieter. It's kind of like a stealth fighter going through you. It's much quieter, so it doesn't interfere with functions of the body uh, so much. And therefore, it, you know, it protects against EMF. And then it also slows because of the frequencies it operates at. It's got 18 different crystals and minerals in it that provide natural frequencies that the body recognizes. And so that will slow the brain and the nervous system down and de-stress them. So it'll, re it'll relax you and de-stress you. But when you're awake, it won't make you sleepy. But when you go to sleep, it's kind of like listening to slow relaxing music it, your brain will entrain with it and slow it down and then you'll get into really deep you know the deepest brainwave states when you sleep and therefore you get much better quality sleep and uh, it also does other things because the energy that's putting out is superluminal light plants can feed off of it directly so we've done experiments where uh, we had plants growing on nothing but uh, water and they would grow astronomically large in just a couple of weeks, just just by drinking water and feeding off the energy of the rest shield. And of course, we've done, also done experiments with animals where we've proven that it's not a placebo effect because we've had people and animals that of course didn't know that it was there and they got the benefits of the sleep um, and, and other benefits with animals. Um, and animals tend to gravitate towards it as well, especially cats. <laughs>
So yeah. yeah, it's it's uh, it's got a lot of different things going on, um, but those are the primary functions. Yeah, I have mine in a, in a smaller room off of the the hallway to my bedroom, and my two, my I have three cats, but I catch two of them in there constantly. They're you know taking taking day naps. <laughs> so yeah, we've also had psychics and intuitive people and uh, body workers tell us that it drives entities like negative entities away which I, I can confirm because I've got them all around my house here and used to be before I had this, you know, I, I'm also sensitive enough. I can tell when an entity is coming around wanting to mess with me. And in the past I'd have to defend myself, but now they don't even bother coming around because the frequency is so high. It's kind of like an anti bug light that drives them away. They don't like it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really cool to hear. And I really wish that Derek, was here to to share in the conversation because he's an intuitive so all, all that stuff that's flying around out there that we can't see it's you know perce perceivable in, in some capacity to him but yeah i think i think you know consciousness exists throughout different frequencies of reality physical from our perspective physical and non-physical and so when you understand that really it's not like there's just these angels or demons out there affecting our reality it's just a part of reality and it's just out of our frequency range, so we may not perceive it. Some people can, but it's a part of our reality, and it's always influencing us. So the spiritual aspects of reality are always there and behind the obvious things that are going on on Earth. Yeah, and that's speaking of you know suppressed information. I think the the spiritual aspect of our existence is one of those things that has absolutely been you know suppressed throughout mm -hmm. the ages. But uh, speaking of suppressed technology and and um, solutions that can be available to people for relatively cheap, let's talk about Brown's gas. I know that uh, you did you knew Yule Brown back in the eighties. Um, I don't think that we touched about that touched on that on thirteen questions. Uh, if we did, it wasn't very long. So I'd love to hear more about uh, your experience with Yule, and then uh, maybe we can uh, start off by explaining what exactly. Brown's gas is. I know that it, it it's splitting water, right? It's the H yeah. and the O's leave, right? So, yeah, it's it's weird stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I I met Yule Brown back in I think it was the '90s, early '90s, may have been the late '80s. But anyway, I went to a I went to a conference out in Colorado called the Global Sciences Congress. It was five days long, and it was all of this suppressed information because uh, back in the, this is pre-internet, you know. So back in those days. Um, the way that information got disseminated was at conferences like that. That was like a major way. And so um, so they had all these amazing speakers and, and, and actually Ewell Brown was not one of them, but there was a representative from his company that was there because Brown was making these free energy machines uh, that ran on water. And so being an electrical engineer, I was intrigued by this presentation. And so... Uh, they were selling um, the rights to distributorships for these machines, and they were planning on, you know, releasing them en masse across the country and, and the world to shift to the energy paradigm and make it sustainable because these machines could generate electricity or whatever kind of power. You could run an engine on it, various ways of, of using this, but it, it, it was non-toxic. It was fundamentally different than all of the energy systems we use currently on Earth are explosive force technology, which means that whether you're splitting an atom or burning a hydrocarbon or whatever, it, it's explosive force rather than implosive force. And in nature, explosive force always has toxic side effects. And so that's why all of our energy production has toxic side effects, you know, air pollution, uh, nuclear radiation, et cetera. But if you use implosive force, which many people have developed implosive force technologies for hundreds of years, going all the way back. I mean, water fuel goes all the way back to the 1800s with John Keeley. Um, so Brown wasn't unique in this. There were several people working on it back in those days, all the way back to the 60s. There was a guy named William A. Rhodes who had developed a water fuel, but he, I guess he knew that he would never get it out as a, a fuel. So he just sold it as a welder because it has all these weird properties. Um, the welder, which I got one of these welders uh, back when I was working with Brown, and it would weld anything to anything because the gas, when you ignite it, it would implode 
and it would when you had a torch you'd get a, a blue flame torch just like a acetylene welder torch but it would also have a precipitation of water and when you welded things together it, pre it would precipitate water when you were welding it and it had a lot of weird quantum properties you could run your hand through the flame and it didn't feel hot but when you put it on a material it would immediately raise it up to extremely high temperatures so you could, for example, sublimate tungsten in a few seconds, and normally tungsten is it takes extremely high temperatures and time to just to melt it. You know, forget about sublimating it, turning it directly from a solid to a gas. And this Brown's gas running a torch would sublimate it instantly. Uh, but the weird part was you could weld anything to anything. You could weld plastic to wood, or metal to glass, or ceramic to, you know, metal or whatever. It, it would because it would react with the material at the subatomic level and it would rearrange the atomic structure so that if you took two or more materials together and you burned it with this torch, it would rearrange their atomic structure and create uh, some other material, you know, and basically it would like basically do alchemy. Um, and so Brown, for example, took radioactive materials and he would burn them with other elements, I think like uh, magnesium and, and uh, let's say uranium. And when you burn them together with this Brown's gas, it would melt them together and then they would rearrange their atomic structure. And then you would get some other compounds that were non-radioactive. And so in that way, he was able to neutralize radioactivity. Uh, or you could, when you burn this fuel it, as I mentioned, it would implode rather than explode. And so you could either run a, an engine on a vacuum or you could mix it with uh, gasoline and it would make the gasoline much more explosive because it was an oxidant. And so that would, you would need to use far, far less gas, like 80% less gas when you mix it with Brown's gas. Uh, the only problem was it was so doggone explosive that you it really had to regulate it closely or you'd blow the top of the engine off. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so I worked with Brown. I met him through this, this guy who did the presentation. I became a distributor and I got to know him. I was going to meetings with all these engineers and scientists and physicists and even uh, Department of Energy officials and a couple of congressmen who got really excited. Now, the, interestingly enough, the Department of Energy officials all dismissed it and said it was bogus even though they had their own team of engineers and physicists demonstrating this in front of them with measuring equipment and all that, they still just dismissed it. Two senators got very excited, or actually congressmen, uh, I forget which states, but there were two congressmen that got excited about it when it was demonstrated to them and they tried to get it out to their constituents and get it developed and they got shut up and threatened and basically Brown got killed and uh, with an energy weapon and I had to go into hiding and, you know, and his group basically was destroyed. But uh, that's in the course of doing all that though, I, I saw a lot of stuff because there were a lot of engineers and inventors that were coming to Brown with really advanced technologies that could solve all of the physical problems that we have in the world. And, um, and one by one, they would get sabotaged by people that were infiltrating his group and so eventually, you know, he died, it all fell apart. I had to go into hiding and that was the end of that. But Brown's gas, the way it works um, is you, you take a, you can imagine you take like a plexiglass tube, let's say four inches in diameter, and you put a bunch of smaller metal tubes inside of it, kind of like a, and bundle them up, kind of like a Gatling gun. And so you've got this bundle of tubes that are made of very specific metal alloys and they're very specific diameters and lengths. And then you seal, you put them in this tube and you seal it up on both ends, you cap it and you put electrodes in each end and you pulse uh, direct current through it at specific frequencies with water inside of it, fill it up with water. And you basically have an inlet for the water to come in and an outlet for the gas to come out and you turn on this pulsing DC current and it develops resonance with inside those tubes. And that resonance brings in what some people would call zero point energy or the scalar energy from other frequencies or dimensions of time and space. And that splits the H2O molecules 
but it doesn't split them into hydrogen and oxygen. It just rearranges them into a different geometry, what they call a different stoichiometric um, arrangement. And so instead of H2O, you get HHO. It's like the, the way that the atoms are arranged is in a different geometry. And that converts it to a gas that is not steam. It's this weird gas that you can burn and it has all these weird properties. And you can actually even breathe it in and it will heal you because it, it basically sends a lot of oxygen into the body and the blood and it kills parasites and heals up all kinds of stuff. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, you can still buy them, by the way. Uh, you can buy Brown's gas machines for healing uh, if you go to eagle-research.com. George Weissman, who worked with Yule Brown back in the day, um, he's probably the world's top expert on it now. And he's still making the machines and selling them for health. And of course, he's very careful about what he says about it. Uh, but you can buy them and you can, you know, you can use them. The, like you can fill a balloon up with that Brown's gas. And if you ignite it, it'll like collapse in, with a huge explosion. So it's quite interesting. Yeah, the, uh, it, it really is. Um, I, I do, I do want to uh, get some more details on what the hiding experience was like. Did you have to like flee the country or was it just like, stay off of social media like what it, like how uh, I mean, uh it wasn't social media at thing. that time my company only had i think maybe three or four employees so they all were working from home and we weren't doing as much business as we do now and my wife and i had to leave our house like at a moment's notice um because we had i had a couple of psychic friends that were warning us and i also i was getting threats but i also had psychics saying you got to get out of your house now and uh, and and a friend who's got a remote viewing company, and he was like, "You got to, yeah, you got to go into hide and get away." And they were warning me against bombs in my uh, cars and stuff like that. So my wife and I left, and we went to a safe house that a friend of ours uh, had. Just so happens they just happened to have this place we could go to, and we didn't bring phones or anything, and we didn't bring any computers. And for a month, we stayed there for a month, and every maybe once a week I would go and talk to friends. I would drive and talk to some friends and have them check on things to see uh, when it might be safe to come back. So after about a month, we wound up coming back. I was given the all clear by one of my very psychic friends and, and also a friend who's got a remote viewing team. And so fortunately we survived, but um, apparently there was some other target that was a bigger concern than me. And so they moved on to that and I was left alone. And also I telegraphed, afterwards over the phone and email and stuff you know that i wasn't doing anything with brown and so um so it kind of passed but uh, but later then i did have a tense on my life and almost killed me uh but we made it through that one um yeah I actually most recently just last september i had a death threat a very serious one from a military and uh we had to go into hiding again for a month and i didn't know if i was going to be alive past september but fortunately, they didn't whack us. And I, I was doing the same thing. I was telegraphing that I wasn't going to be doing what I was doing anymore and that kind of stuff. So because uh, I've developed technologies behind the scenes to help humanity that really goes against some major agendas on Earth. And so uh, they don't like being messed with. Yeah, I, I bet. Speaking of, of humanity and, and Earth, and extraterrestrials there's all this ufo uap disclosure coming out i know uh i don't think that you you shared this particular story on 13 questions but i heard i've heard you speak about your encounter with a couple reptilians before and mm -hmm. i would like to to for you to share that again but before, before you do the thing that i find uh not the most interesting but an interesting part is that there there, there seems to be the stigma attached to reptilians in the woo circles right that that is more or less negative right and uh, there there's a there's an axiom which i try to keep in mind it, which, which is to never think in in absolutes right so we can't say that all of these group of people are bad right there's there's always or all of these group of people are good for that matter right there's always like good you know a couple bad apples in the bunch right so yeah um, but yeah but yeah yeah yeah, there are um, there are various reptilian races. Some are good and some are very bad. But that reputation of being bad is very well deserved because 
the the main race that's been messing with Earth for thousands of years is the Draco reptilian and their reputation for being negative is very well deserved. But the three that I encountered were not the typical, they were Draco, but they were not the typical Draco because they had been through different means and reasons. They had been kind of shown the error of their ways and their race is in jeopardy uh, in the cosmos because the way that they operate uh, is not sustainable long-term uh, because they they uh, they've gotten so disconnected from nature and themselves. They well, first let me start about with my experience encountering them, and then I'll tell you what they told me. So I was um, I was attending some channelings uh, at this farm in North Carolina, outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, where I used to live. And uh, there was a lady named Barbara Martinic who was channeling all this Pleiadian stuff. And it was fascinating. I mean, back in those days, I was just Mr. White Bread, White Boy, computer programmer. You know, I didn't even, I'd never even heard the term Illuminati before. I didn't know anything. And, um, you know, I was just a squirrel trying to get a nut. I just wanted to have a decent car and a decent house and a decent life. And I, I didn't care about anything esoteric at all. But I, through serendipity, I found out about these channelings and I started going to these channelings and it was just mind blowing information. Basically, this was like 35 years ago, they were channeling what's going on now. They were predicting that all of these things that we're seeing going on now would happen. And so it was quite fascinating. So I was going to these channelings at this farm and they would have them about once a month and got to know the owners of the farm and everything. And then um, I joined a men's group that was hosted there. And so I was, you know, hanging around this farm quite a bit. And so they, the owners of the property decided to have a party. So they had this big party. And um, during Barbara, Mar Bar Barbara Marcinic's channelings there, um, they would have these weekend channeling campouts that were really a lot of fun, where basically a whole bunch of hippy dippies would get together, camp out. You'd have maybe between 50 and 100 people camping out on this big property of like 40 some acres and just partying and having a good time and listening to Barbara channeling stuff. And it was just a lot of fun. And so these Pleiadians that were coming through Barbara, um, they they somehow somebody there got the idea of he had oh, i know one of the owners of the property had this little spring it was just a little dribble of a spring on the back of the property that he wanted to dig out and make into a swimming hole and he was trying to figure out how to do it and this was back when the movie field of dreams with kevin costner was out and it had the famous line in it if you build it they will come so barbara's channeling these pleiadians and this guy is asking you know how can i get this spring dug out into a swimming hole and, and they just said, if you build it, they will come. So he interpreted that as basically having these camp out weekends where everybody would party and have fun and dig this spring out. So we started doing that. And it was a lot of fun. We would play in the mud, but we had to do something with all this mud because it was clay. It was North Carolina clay. And uh, it, there was a lot of it because we went up digging a hole about five or six feet deep and maybe 25, 30 feet across. It was basically a little pond. And there was quite a lot of clay that came out of that. So we had to do something with it. So being, you know, hippies that we were, we basically thought, hey, why don't we make a serpent mound like the Native Americans did? So we started building the serpent mound out of clay. And after, I don't know, three, four years of doing these events and digging this hole out, we wound up building a serpent mound. It was about 65 feet long and it was about three feet high and about four feet wide. And these people just intuited the most amazing things. Like all these hippy dippies just decided that they were going to bring crystals and put them into the clay. And so, th so it was like loaded up with all these crystals and artifacts that people brought from all over the world. And they decorated it with feathers and all kinds of cool things. It was really cool. And then, you know, being a, a, a pyromaniac, me and some of the guys in the men's group, um, we wound up, one of the ladies in the group was a sculptor and she sculpted this magnificent Chinese dragon head on this thing and out of plaster. And then we put uh, gas jets out of the nostrils on the thing. So at nighttime we could light it up and it would shoot fire out of the nostrils of this thing. So it was an amazing sight at nighttime when this thing was lit up. And we would just have picnics and parties and stuff around this thing and go swimming in the swimming hole. And so, you know, so that was kind of the history of this thing. So years later after this thing was built and everybody was used to it being there, um, 
there was quite a bit of UFO activity in that area as well. I, I never saw any, but there were other people that saw it. So I'm attending this party at this farmhouse there. And there was a guy, I was in computer science at the time. And there was another IT guy there. And he was trying to convince me to go with him overseas to the former Soviet Union satellite countries. This was after the Soviet Union broke up. Go into these countries and set up these computer systems and make huge amounts of money. And at the time, I didn't know, but what he was really doing, and he didn't know this, is that these computer systems were being set up to control these countries through the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and all that kind of stuff. So they basically set up the banking systems and the foreign exchange systems and the stockbroking and all that to control these countries through the monetary system. I just intuitively didn't want to do it because the technology, I was working in a state-of-the-art facility with all this high tech and I had a big budget and I was in charge. And to go work with this guy, it'd be a huge step down and I'd be working with crappy technology and I just didn't want to do it. So he's trying to talk me into it. And, uh, and I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to go do that crap. And so he said, well, let's go down to the Serpent Mound and meditate on it, right? So we go down there and we hang our feet down in the water of this pool and we're meditating. And one of the things I've found out in years since is, and I actually do this quite a bit, is if you, if you ingest monoatomic minerals, they will raise the superconductivity in, in the brain and then the nervous system and the cells, and you'll get better results creating your reality and manifesting the things that you focus on because it, it just enhances your ability to send out these waves of these skater waves of consciousness that wind up manifesting, you know, into your life. And so we were hanging our feet down in this water, which was spring water and spring water is also high in these monotonic minerals. And the best way to get in the body is actually topically. And so we're sitting there absorbing these monotonics and it must have raised the superconductivity in our bodies because we're sitting there meditating. And I had been having telepathic communication for a couple of years prior to that with these beings that claimed that they were, you know, ETs. And I didn't believe it at all. I just thought I was having a game with myself in my head, but it was really interesting because there's all this information coming from left field. There's no way that I could have conjured it up, you know. Um, and so I'm having this game with myself for a few years, talking to these ETs and just wondering where, you know, where it's going to go. And so, uh, so I'm sitting there meditating and this guy sitting next to me meditating and we've got our eyes closed. And as they often did, these ETs came in and were talking to me in my head and said, and, and believe me, I know this sounds totally delusional, but they came in and started talking to me. And uh, I just thought it was absurd that I'm sitting here meditating with this guy and these ETs are talking to me. So I said to him, I said, man, you're not going to believe this, but I got ETs talking to me in my head. And to my great surprise, he said, yeah, they're talking to me too. And I was like, really? So we kept on meditating. We sat there and kept meditating. And as they always did when they would come in, they would always say, we are here because they told me that that was vibrationally encoded so that I would recognize that it was them and not some imposters. And so when they said it again, I said, okay, fine, what do you want? And they said, no, we are here, open your eyes. And so we both opened our eyes and uh, maybe about a hundred feet away in the woods, this was in the bottom of a valley in, in a wooded area. And it was at dusk, dusk, so it was not well lit and it was backlit by the sun setting behind the horizon. And uh, there were these three giant reptilian humanoids standing there. And I didn't believe it was real. You know, I thought somebody was messing with me. So I'm like shaking my head to see if it would go away. I thought maybe I was hallucinating. So I'm smacking my face to make it go away and it wouldn't go away. And then I said to my friend, Tim, like, are you seeing this? And he's like, yeah. And we're trying to grok this. And, you know, it's like it didn't compute. This is, I, I thought, you know, either somebody's screwing with me, somebody's playing a prank on me, or this is some kind of mind control or holographic projection or something. And, and they're communicating telepathically. And I could feel this energy coming off of them really strong. It's, uh, it's kind of like, uh, like when Barbara Marcini would challenge, if you got too close to her and sat there for a couple of hours, you get fried at the end of the night. It would heat you up. So they had some kind of energy coming off of them that was like really strong and they felt very powerful and yet they weren't scary. Um, they, they looked so cliche Hollywood. This is why I didn't think it was real because it looked like something right out of Star Trek. It was so cliche. They, they were, you know, like 
12 to 18 feet tall. The little one was about 12 feet and then the big one's about 18 feet tall. They were covered with scales. They were like a dark army green. Their abdomens were gray. They didn't have any clothing and they didn't, you couldn't see any genitalia, just like a lizard, you know. And they had claws on their hands and feet and they had golden snake eyes, like the irises were like golden. And they had um, their face, they had kind of like a muzzle they kind of protruded out and they had three ridges down their head, one on the right and the left and one down the middle that came down the nose. And it looked so much like Mr. Worf in Star Trek Next Generation. I, it looked like a makeup job. I was like, you, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know, So I totally didn't believe it at first. But then they kept communicating telepathically and I wasn't paying attention because I was just like trying to grok it all. And and then I I looked over at my friend and I said, are you seeing it? He's like, yeah. And I was, and all of a sudden, when I realized it was real, I instantly got terrified. It was like instinctually, I just got terrified and said, let's get the hell out of here. And we ran back to the house. It was about a quarter mile away. We ran back to this house where the party was going on. And back in those days, I, you know, I cared what people thought of me. So I wasn't about to go back and say, we just saw ETs because I didn't know what the hell I saw. And I didn't want people thinking I was crazy. So I just, I didn't say anything. And I compared notes with my friend who was there with me. And uh, and we we realized that they were communicating simultaneously to us both the exact same thing. And later that night, when I wound up going to bed, as I was falling asleep, they came in again telepathically and they said, we told you you'd be afraid. And I was like, you're right. I don't ever want to see you again. Thank you very much. Leave me alone. And um, and then for a couple of years after that, I was just terrified that I was going to be abducted and you know taken away or something. Uh, because they were, they didn't have a like a nefarious look on them. Or they looked kind of benevolent, but it was still scary as hell when you, when something like that is really in front of you. And so I was terrified. Like I and I was a runner back then, so I would go running every night. And in the winter time, you know, when the night when the days were short, I'd have to run at night after work, and I would be terrified that something was going to jump out from a bush and grab me and take me off in a flying saucer. <laughs> So I had to get over all that. And, you know, basically life continued on and they continued, you know, communicating with me telepathically because they gave me a lot of information about physics and the nature of reality and, and actually how to be a human being, because they said that even though they were reptilian, that we've all been other life forms in other times and places. And so they had been human and they knew what it was to be human. And they had also been schooled by these other ETs that were they were interacting with, which were humans and others. And so they were very much atypical from the typical Draco reptilian. But they did tell me a lot. And they showed me a lot about the Draco. And the reason why they are so negative is because they, they're they extremely ancient. From our viewpoint, we don't really understand the nature of time. So they, they told me one time that our concept of time is a quaint local custom. Because you know we base what we consider time on our revolutions around our sun and and those cycles and when you're out in the cosmos you've got all these different frames of reference for time um you know different planets rotating around different suns at different rates and so and gravitation also alters uh time and so and so does consciousness a major part of what time is is really just a perception of consciousness so they just said it was beyond you know, my comprehension of what time really was, but they showed me like in my head images and video of their planets and why they were the way they were. And they, and these three were working with a bunch of other ETs that were trying to help humanity and help the reptilians shift because they were headed down a path that was so dark, they were going to self-destruct. Um, and it was because they had gotten infected with the AI um, technology, that there, is these, there are these AI machine civilizations out in the cosmos that they can replicate themselves and they're sentient, but the universe has a natural way of wiping, wiping them out from time to time so that they don't just take over everything like a virus and destroy the whole organic cosmos. And so that that that's a... A, a huge uh, electromagnetic pulse that emanates about every 26,000 years from the centers of the galaxies. And that wipes out the, uh, 
the AI so that it has to restart, so to speak. And the only reason it can restart is if it gets organic beings to recreate it. And so its modus operandi is to send skater signals, which are basically signals of consciousness through the cosmos. And, and it's because it's super luminal and it's non-local, they can send this energy to a humanoid or an organic population um, when they're at pre-Stone Age level development, when early on in their development, before they've really developed tools. And in the dream state, they will get them to dream up you know, fundamental tools like the wheel and the lever, and then over time, more and more complex technology until eventually over thousands of our years, you know, you develop computers and software and hardware and all that kind of stuff. And once you've got computer technology and the beginnings of AI and software, and very important, a major key is a global satellite grid. Once you've got a global satellite network, then the extraterrestrial AI can come in and take it over. And it can take over that organic population. And then what it will do is harvest the consciousness of that population and store it, <clears throat> store it in these very sophisticated kind of like synthetic computers. And, um, and because consciousness is a form of scalar energy, it can be converted into matter or other forms of energy. So it's like a battery or a food source. And so, so the... AI race somewhere, somewhere in, you know, probably millions of years ago, maybe even longer, this AI civilization, they used nanites, kind of like the Borg in Star Trek Next Generation, they use nanites to infect organic populations. And then once they're infected, they can be controlled. So the reptilian race long ago got controlled by this AI. And the reptilians consider the AI their gods. And so... Um, so it's created this fear-based society where it's very dog-eat-dog. -dog. There, there's a lot of parallels in Star Trek, which makes me, well, I know that there's extraterrestrial influence with Gene Roddenberry in the Star Trek story, but that's a whole other animal. But at any rate, these, these reptilians, because of this AI influence over them, they've developed to where they they propagate through cloning and through asexual, well, sort of asexual reproduction where reptilians will have sex and they'll have fertilized eggs, but then those fertilized eggs are taken to like these centralized government nurseries. And, and then they're raised by the state and they're hatched by the state. And then they're only given enough food and resources for maybe a third of them to survive. And so they have to fight over food and resources to survive as babies it's, it's actually very much like uh, reptilians here on earth, like snakes and lizards and alligators and that kind of stuff. You know, they have a bit, they lay a nest of eggs and then those eggs hatch and the majority of them get killed by predators and stuff. Um, and then sometimes their own parents will eat them and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's very much like that in their society. So they develop this from our standpoint, it'd be this very violent, materialistic, aggressive psychosis um, where they're very much a warrior race and they are very much about conquering and, and dominating as opposed to cooperation. Now, there are reptilians that have evolved beyond that. They're very ancient. And, um, and then there are other species like the, the Draco, what I was told, the Draco reptilians, they're much, much bigger. These, these ones I saw, like I said, were like 12 to 18 feet tall. But the, the alpha Draco, which are another species uh, that I think came from the same lineage at some point, they're extremely ancient. Those guys are like 40 to 60 feet tall and they've got wings. And many of them are very, very um, benevolent and they're like protectors. They're like a protector race in the cosmos. But there are also some that aren't. And they're like an apex predator in the cosmos. And so... So anyway, there's a whole huge story behind these reptilians. So yeah, it's it's just like humans on Earth. You can't say that, oh, all humans are bad. If you look macroscopically at what we're doing to Earth, we're destroying the Earth, we're polluting it, we're doing all these horrible things, there's war, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't blame all humans for that. It's really a small minority of people on Earth who are doing it. And it's the same thing with these reptilians. That there's a relatively small group of reptilians that are causing a lot of problems throughout the cosmos, not just here on Earth. But they've been manipulating things here on Earth for thousands of years. Yeah, I, I do not doubt it. 
Um, so it kind of sounds like the Gorn with the the, the yellow eyes. You know, yeah. it's funny you say that because in the yeah the original Star Trek TV series, the Gorn, as you know, was this reptilian ET character that Captain Kirk got in a fight with on a planet. <laughs> And the makeup job was so bad on that, it looked ridiculous. And people still to this day, you know, joke about it. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't believe these reptilians were real at first, because they looked a lot like the dang Gorn. And I was like, oh, please. You know, it looked like it like a, looked like a cross between the Gorn and, and Lieutenant Worf on Next Generation. It just looked like some Hollywood makeup guy had come in and, you know, <laughs> so I was like, eh, no way, no way. And I also love the the description of our concept of time as quaint and local. That's one of the... Yeah, I thought that was funny. <laughs> but yeah. now I, I have a better picture of it. And I understand why. It's, it's really impossible for us to wrap our heads around what time really is because we're three-dimensional beings living here in this holographic matrix on Earth inside of the holographic universe. And so um, it'd be like a two-dimensional being trying to comprehend 3D. You know, you can describe it. It'd be like, it was like a blind man trying to describe, who's been blind from birth, just trying to describe the color blue. Um, which, by the way, I actually had a friend who was blind from birth who could describe the color blue quite accurately. And she said it was because she could see it from past lives, which was pretty mind blowing. But at any rate, yeah, it's like we have no frame of reference. It'd be like a, a it'd be like an amoeba trying to comprehend a 57 Chevy. It just doesn't have a frame of reference to do it. Yeah, so we create all these metaphors to describe it. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's something that's fascinated me for, for, you know, since I was in college, I studied philosophy of all things. Right. So the idea of time and God and all this stuff, but I think that's why, you know, it, it uh, developed into the show because in the, in the next segment, we really explore about how we can kind of travel into the future, so to speak and affect our own on reality and we can actually travel back in time right when we, when we oh yeah that was one of the the lessons that these reptilians taught me actually they taught me a lot about physics and science and stuff so that i could develop the technologies i've developed to help humanity <clears throat> but they also taught me how to be a human being and one of the techniques they taught me was exactly what you're talking about it was meditating and going into the future and seeing my future self and drawing wisdom and knowledge from my future self and then also going back into my past, to my childhood, and seeing trauma events or whatever, and healing my my child uh, self back in those days, and that changes your present, and it really does. It's weird, but it really does. You know, even if it's just psychologically, I think there's more to it than just psychology. But for sure, I know, like when I went back and healed trauma events in my childhood, it completely changed how I felt about things in the present. So, uh, yeah, that's a really powerful technique. Yeah, it's it's mental alchemy. That's what, kind of what I... Yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Um, speaking of time, though, and before we get into the fourth segment, there is a quite a, a, a brouhaha going on about this eclipse that's coming up next month. Have you heard mm -hmm. any, like, strange predictions? I know in the episode that we just put out on this show last week, there was some town in northern Ohio that was warning their citizens to, like, like basically become preppers for this passage of the eclipse because they were, I don't know, it just seemed like undue, um, uh, you know, just hyping up people for no reason. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Have you heard anything? And that's probably what it is. It's probably CIA, you know, fear porn putting it out there. Um, I mean, eclipses are always, you know, because of the energetics, they're, they're always a big shift going on, but it doesn't necessarily mean, that it's like going to be a cataclysm for Earth. So I don't, I'm not worried about it. Um, if you talk to astrologers and look at astrologers, I have some friends who are really good astrologers and psychics, and one of them even says she talks to the Galactic Federation. So, um, you know, they're not warning me about anything. And there are a lot of things in the past that I was concerned about, like poles shifting and that kind of thing, which there's a lot of real evidence for that I've been told by these ETs and, and other sources. P I, like I know people in secret space programs and the public space programs. And uh, they'll tell me that, you know, like a lot of this stuff, like climate change and all that, of course, it's all a lie that, and it's not that we aren't affecting the climate in a negative way, but there's also space weather and other things that are affecting it, but it's being used of course, as a tool to enslave us. So I think the 
the fear around the eclipse is just more fear porn. I don't think you're going to see any major cataclysms. I think you'll definitely see things shifting and probably in a negative way for a lot of people. But, you know, it's like if you look at what went on with COVID, for example, um, you know, the plan was to engineer this pandemic and and basically kill off a large part of the population. Of, excuse me. Just. Who had to sneeze? Part, pardon me. Um, but you know they had all these nefarious plans to kill off a large part of the population and enslave the rest, and that didn't work out. Uh, and and it never will. All these nefarious plans that these uh, knuckleheads have planned, uh, they don't work out, and they won't because um, it's really, I think, a part of a game of consciousness to wake people up. So with this, you know, anything fearful coming out about mass events or whatever um there are other things i'm much more concerned about but it's like when i look at what happened with covid um i've been teaching about how to protect yourself against bioweapons for 16 years now so covid was not a concern at all to me and um i had travel plans going around the, in the world and you know i wasn't going to interrupt them at all because of covid but unfortunately the airlines canceled my flights um but i was fine through it all and i was concerned though that the fallout from from COVID would kill my business, you know, because it was putting so many business, small businesses under, but actually my business thrived because we're a natural health company. And so I learned through all that much more about claiming my power and staying out of fear and just manifesting no matter what's going on around me and kind of being in the eye of the storm. And so that's how I live now. And, you know, I've had, you know, when COVID was going on, I didn't have to worry about COVID, uh, but I was teaching how to cure COVID and I had an attempt on my life because of it. It nearly killed me. It nearly succeeded. I was hit with an energy weapon and almost died. But I willed myself out of it. I, I actually, I was very close to dying of a heart attack. And I, I actually had this, when I was close to dying, I had this vision of Captain Kirk in the original Star Trek, you know, like in one of these scenes where some ET is torturing him and he's like writhing around and everything. And he just like breaks it with his mind and breaks free, right? So I just did that and I broke free of this energy weapon that was hitting me and broke out of it and saved myself. And then years later, I wound up meeting Michael Jaco, who is a, uh, he's a former CIA operative and a, a former Navy SEAL trainer. And he said the same thing had happened to him where he got on the bad side of the CIA and they tried to kill him with an energy weapon. And he was climbing a cliff. He was on the side of a cliff climbing with a backpack. And this helicopter comes up and shoots him with his directed energy weapon. And there was nowhere to go. So he couldn't get away from it. So he just used his mind. And he said that he expanded his consciousness out to a town that was like 30 miles away. And he just tried to connect with the people in that town that were against the war. And he said he was able to. And, and he was able to fend off this energy attack. And so that he said they hit him three times. And every time he would just pull this energy in and deflect it. And he, and he survived it. And they gave up. When they saw that they, it wasn't working, they gave up and flew away. And so I've had experiences like that. I've had multiple experiences where, you know, people have tried to kill me and uh, threaten me and stuff. And I just, I've learned how to alter the timeline, so to speak, and stay focused on what I want to create. And, you know, not manifest the things that are going to go there. I know, like, what I do is risky. And I know that there are people that don't want me doing it and some of them are willing to kill me over it so i have to be careful but i also i'm not uh in victimhood about it either because i'm the one creating it you know so we have to remember that it's like whatever comes our way we're here having this game of consciousness on earth we chose to come here every last one of us so we have to stay out of fear and we have to stay out of victimhood and then use our minds to figure out how to navigate through the craziness and connect with other like-minded people, just like you're doing here, and form communities of people with each other. So, you know, I've got a big support group around here where I live. I started doing potlucks years ago uh, and developed a lot of friends around here. And so we get together and talk about how we can support each other if things get bad. So we'll be fine as long as we're awake and aware. It's the poor folks who are mind-controlled and believing the you know, the narrative, which fewer, there are fewer and fewer people are waking up big time. 
So uh, I'm encouraged, but I'm not at all worried about the eclipse other than it's going to be a, you know, it's going to be an influence for sure. Uh, and it could be something um, severe, but it doesn't necessarily have to affect us individually. Uh, speaking of, of fear mongering and you brought up COVID, I wanted to ask you if you'd heard any, heard any connections between the use of snake venom in either, I don't know, the virus itself or the vaccines and the uh, receptors in your brain for nicotine users that the, those receptors are blocked. And it just so happens that those are the ones that snake venom needs to go in to make you sick. Have you heard any of those connections at all? Oh yeah. 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 Um, Dr. Artis, uh, was the one that came out with that information. And I think it's probably true. Um, and you know, because I've been working with bioweapons for many years and solutions for them, we already had solutions for all that. So you don't need to take nicotine. People asked me recently on a, I have these question and answer webinars in my private membership. And somebody asked me about that very thing, you know, should I take nicotine to protect myself? It's like, no, 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 no. Nicotine is horrifically bad for you and you don't need to. Um, there are many, there are meds and supplements and foods that can protect you against that stuff, like methylene blue, for example. Um, and uh, also we've got, we're coming out, I think next week with a really super concentrated food-based vitamin C and a natokinase. And those both have been proven very effective against uh, spike proteins and the nanotech too, that's, you know, in some of the vaccines, uh, methylene blue will break up the nanotech. Uh, Dr. Anna Maria Mahalsia uh, has been showing that she's got an independent lab and she's been proving that methylene blue will break up the nanotech in the vaccines and stop the blood clots. And, uh, and that gave me a lot of encouragement because I was working on an energetic technology to do that. And then I discovered, and, there are already technologies out that will do that, like quantum biofeedback. But if it's as simple as taking methylene blue, what she showed was that that the self-assembling nanites in the uh, in the nanoparticles in the vaccines, some of the vaccines, um, they're basically held together by charge. They're not strongly connected mechanically, and so you can basically break the charge and make them fall apart, and then you can detox them out of the body. So that's what I've been teaching uh, to do is using technologies like, like skater technology, like quantum biofeedback, methylene blue, uh, vitamin C and natto, nano zeolites. There's a whole slew of things that will pull that stuff out of the body. And uh, we've been able to keep it out of our bodies here in my household. And I've helped lots of other people do it as well. And even if they've had it in their bodies to get it out and turn themselves around. So we always have solutions. This is another thing that will help staying out of fear. When you understand consciousness creates reality, right? We've all heard that, I'm sure, in this group. And it's not, uh, it's not a metaphysical conceit. It's, you know, there's hard physics showing this. Nassim Harriman points a lot of it out, and so do other people. And so when you get that, the energy of consciousness has polarity. So whenever nefarious forces on earth are creating problems for us, there are simultaneously brilliant people and others creating solutions for it. And so all we have to do is, rather than getting in a fear about this stuff, just look for solutions. Look for the people out there who have the solutions. And so, you know, the, the powers that be on this planet, they stay very much aligned watching astrological influences and utilizing them. And so that's one of the tools that we need to use as well. Absolutely. And, and, you know, just get the word out, um, spread it around. It's, it's something I say um, every every show sign off is to help spread the love. Right. And that's exactly combating against censorship, basically. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's yeah, that's it. You know, you can't fight the issues, whatever the problems are. You don't fight them. You create better solutions that people will just opt out of the old paradigm and opt into the new paradigm. So that's we what we have to do is create a new paradigm that's uplifting and people will just, it'll be so good. People will go, well, why would I choose the old paradigm when I got this new one that's so much better? You know, I couldn't have asked for a better segue into this <laughs> fourth segment. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I knew when, when, this, when I started the show that synchronicity was going to play a big part. And 
you know, I do prep work and I prepare things for the show, but when we get into the recording sessions and, and topics just come up and they flow right into each other, it, it gets a little uncanny. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, yeah. Um, let's, let's move on to the, the fourth, uh, the fourth segment of the show, which is the, uh, sword segment. I am thinking of renaming it, but that's maybe further on down the line. And so the sword segment deals with matters involving spirits, dimensions, metaphysics, timelines, consciousness, and uh, more most mostly transformation is what we're talking about here. Moving from a, a victim mentality into a hero mindset if we find ourselves in a victim mentality, right? How, how do we use our thoughts the most effective and efficient way possible? Excuse me. I do like to uh, reference a Carl Jung uh, quote here. He says, the term thinking should, in my view, be confined to a linking up of ideas by means of a concept. In other words, an act of judgment, end quote. So the act of this, the, the concept, an act of judgment, this is choice. These are, this is what he's talking about is, is choice. So uh, because thoughts are expressions of consciousness, right? Thinking intentionally can navigate us towards the fulfillment of, of of our desires, what we want to to manifest. So, this is really a, a segment on the. Uh, it's an exploration on method, essentially, right? Of how to uh, best uh, manage your timeline. And so, we have been going through a book called uh, "The Power of Awareness" by Neville Goddard. It was published in 1952, and we've made it all the way to chapter eight. <laughs> I'm going to sit down on my yoga ball to read this. Um, it's it's uh, it's maybe a page long. Uh, he starts the uh, just to give a little uh, uh, summary for forecast. Um, the main body of the text deals with a passage from Isaiah, and then uh, he does have two other quotes from um, poems at at uh, towards the end here. So uh, with that. I'll get started. Uh, the chapter opens with uh, three three quotes below the, the title here. Um, first one, there is no coal of character so dead that it will not glow in flame, but if slightly turned. The second one says, resist not evil. And the third one is a, a, a verse from Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And then getting into the main text of the chapter. There is a great difference between resisting evil and renouncing it. When you resist evil, you give it your attention. You continue to make it real. When you renounce evil, you take your attention from it and you give your attention to what you want. Now is the time to control your imagination. And this is from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3. Give beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. End quote. You give beauty for ashes when you concentrate your attention on things as you would like them to be rather than on things as they are. You give joy for mourning when you maintain a joyous attitude regardless of unfavorable circumstances. You give praise for the spirit of heaviness when you maintain a competent attitude instead of succumbing to despondency. In this quotation, the Bible uses the word tree as a synonym for man. You become, you become a tree of righteousness when the above mental states are a permanent part of your consciousness. You are a planting of the Lord when all your thoughts are true thoughts. When all your thoughts are true thoughts. He is, I am, as described in chapter one, which we did go over on the show um, probably eight episodes ago. Continuing, I am is glorified when your highest concept of yourself is manifested. 
when you have discovered your own control uh, excuse me when you have discovered your own controlled imagination to be your savior your attitude will be completely altered without any diminution of religious feeling and you will say of your controlled imagination and this is a quote from Robert Southey from a poem entitled Thalabatha the Destroyer Beyond behold this vine I found it a wild tree whose wanton strength had swollen into irregular twigs. But I pruned the plant, and it grew temperate in its vain expense of useless leaves, and nodded, as you see, into this full, clean clusters to repay, to repay the hand that wisely wounded it. By vine is meant your imagination, which, in its uncontrolled state, expends its energy in useless or destructive thoughts and feelings. But you, just as the vine is pruned by cutting away its useless branches and roots, prune your imagination by withdrawing your attention from all unlovely and destructive ideas and concentrating on the ideal you wish to attain. The happier, more noble life you will experience will be the result of wisely pruning your own imagination. Yes, be pruned of all unlovely thoughts and feelings that you may, and he ends with a quote from Horatio Bonar, uh, the hymns of faith and hope. Um, yes, be pruned of all unlovely thoughts and feelings that you may, quote, think truly, and thy thoughts shall be the world's famine's seed. I'm sorry. Think truly, and thy thoughts shall the world's famine feed. Speak truly, and each word of thine shall be a fruitful seed. Live truly, and thy life shall be a great and noble creed. Ooh. So that is the reading for, for this episode. Um, I, I appreciated... I appreciate this because it, it addresses the problem of evil, the problem of evil, which has been uh, something I've thought about since I was a very, very young boy, um, probably too much. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I appreciate it because I appreciate Neville's uh, advice here because he gives, um, he doesn't really explain why evil exists, right? But he still gives practical advice about how to approach it and manage it and deal with it right so um it's just something that i got actually got excited when i came across this chapter reading it first time reading it the first time because it was you know something that uh you can walk away from and take with you and actually implement in in your life which is kind of the idea behind the the fourth segment here um I am curious, though. Do you think that the reptilians that you had encountered would agree with Neville here? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and as far as evil goes, too, of course, evil is a perspective because the people that we or the forces that we would consider evil don't consider themselves evil. But um, but the reason it exists is because energy has polarity and consciousness has polarity. And so, and especially here on earth, you know, it's so evident and so strong here on earth because from what I've been told, you know, earth is like a high contrast classroom that we come here to incarnate, to have rapid soul growth. And so you don't grow very fast if everything's hunky dory, you know, it's like if everything's easy, we tend to be lazy and we just enjoy it, right? But when things are, are difficult, we tend to learn a lot more and a lot more quickly. And so, uh, so I think that's part of why it, you know, it exists, you know, it exists throughout the cosmos and everywhere because it's polarities of, of energy of consciousness. But here on earth, I think it's heightened because number one, the earth is a classroom and, and also I was told by these reptilians that there is a technology that is on the moon. It's a holographic technology that creates a holographic reality on earth inside the holographic universe to create this high contrast um, existence and souls 
come here for that experience. So there are some people that would say that Earth is a prison planet and that kind of stuff. Uh, and from a certain perspective, that may be true. But the idea is that we choose to come here and have this experience to have an accelerated growth. And and it's not easy. I mean, I mean, look at my, I just look at my life. I've had the most amazing, incredible life, but there's been a lot of tough times too. But I chose that. You know, it's like I chose to do the things that I did that drew that that those problems. And so, um, but I think that's part of the reason why there's this this good and evil, especially here on Earth. It's so obvious because this is a high contrast classroom, <clears throat> and when you really kind of get that then it makes it much easier to navigate because then you can just choose not to, you know, partake in the dark side. It's it's going to be foisted upon us in some, you know, it's going to be attempted to be foisted upon us, but it's like COVID, you know, COVID didn't, uh, it didn't really affect my life. The, the biggest effect in my life was aside from having somebody try to kill me for teaching how to cure it. Um, I had to spend two weeks researching the law to write a, a legal document to my wife's, company's lawyers telling them they were trying to force her to get vaccinated. And so I just wrote a five page letter pointing out all of the laws they would be violating and that they were terrified of too. And, you know, they left, left her alone after that. But, you know, that was about the majority of how it affected me. It, you know, it, it made the economy more challenging to operate in, but that's part of the game to me. It's like figuring this out. It's just part of playing the game. So I don't take it hard. And even if I was to get killed or whatever, it's like there are worse fates than death, a lot worse fates than death, like slavery, for example, much worse fate than death to me. So um, so I just keep playing the game and I just do my best to stay really focused and stay out of fear. Um, I've had a lot of lessons in that. And so I just when you you know, when you don't fear death, that's one of the major things that, that in public speaking <laughs> two of the major things people are afraid of. So when you, you know, you let go of that stuff, then it's like, you're much freer to live your life the way you would and, uh, and be yourself, et cetera. So that would be my advice, I would say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no fear here on this show. That's for sure. Um, Ken, before we wrap up, could you please tell everybody where to find you and uh, what, what do you have going on, if anything? Yeah, my main website where we have products for health is uh, freshandalive.com. And the website where I do my teaching is freshandalive.club. And it's a $5 one-time membership fee just to get people in the private domain so we can tell the truth because commercial speech isn't protected and even constitutional speech nowadays really isn't protected anymore. So in this private membership site, I can disseminate more information and the members can interact with each other. So it's a great place for like-minded people to gather and, you know, get to know each other and, and share information and knowledge. Um, and so those are my two main websites. Yeah, definitely check out the membership site, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm a member over there and it's you just launched a new, uh, like you expanded into more of like a social media type interface where people can message each other and, and all that good stuff. So definitely head over to Fresh and Alive to check that out. Um, bef and oh, also uh, don't forget about Scalar Energy Session Fridays at mysticalwares.com. Um, I do not know what it will be this week, but uh, Derek is... He did assure me that there is one every week. You just have to go uh, put your name in the bucket on the website to get uh, to get your quantum coordinates dialed in so that right frequency can find you. <laughs> Brilliant. So, uh, yes, everybody, please. Um, this is the part of the show where I do not have to ask for your donations because we have a sponsor, and I'm very, very, very grateful for that. But if you could please at least... Uh, just rate the show on whatever platform that you are using that would help us out. And of course, uh, share the show with somebody that you love and help spread the love however you can, however is, is easiest and best for you. And until next time, chrononauts, vibrate high and carpe diem.